And not only is it that that it is the actual scriptural Durga Puja uh, or um, Basanti uh, Navratri, but it ends with Ram's birthday. So Ram Navami, who is the one who brought, who called upon Durga in the fall to beat, uh, to de defeat Ravana. So it's very connected. This is a very special time. <laughs> Uh, and I feel so um, happy to be here. And as we begin, um, I just wanted to do my roll call beforehand. So I do it differently. I know in most presentations, we wait till the end to do the biography, but I'm I'm here because of all of these people. So this is Ananda Maima um, and is my, one of my gurus, my, my childhood guru, and I've since grown in my training. Um, but she is the first. And then um, I want to call in Dr. Neela Bhattacharya Saxena, who has two amazing books on Kali. Um, Alice Walker will talk about eco womanism, 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 and she defined womanism um, in her book, In Search of Our Mother's Gardens. Dr. Raj Balkaran, who's an incredible teacher of Devi Mahatya, which is the scriptural place where we begin our uh, baby worship. Um, Melanie Harris, whose book I will read to you from. Uh, Vandana Shiva, amazing eco warrior. If you haven't read Vandana Shiva's work, a Gandhian who is still alive and doing incredible stuff. Um, Octavia Butler, uh, Afrofuturist who changed my life and propelled me your life. How did a PhD from Morton, <laughs> who became a corporate exec, become a Hindu chaplain? And, one of the reasons is Octavia Butler, and then Rabindranath Tagore, who is an incredible spiritual being, who uh, being a Bengali, I have really um, gained wisdom from and will quote today. So saying that, um, Rabindranath Tagore sets the theme for today's talk. So um, what reunites uh, the Shakta tradition uh, with uh, nature traditions with eco womanism is the holding of paradox, really sitting with paradox. Um, and so, this talk, I hope, will remove false dichotomies a little bit in an incremental way from your being today. Um, so, let me quote Rabindranath Tagore, who writes in Cloud Messenger about the wedding song of the sky and the earth. Finally, Today, I was revisiting Maladoma Sume's work, who, who is the African, the Daru, who recently passed, um, but has exactly the same words in his own tradition. So I was, I was revisiting that. But Rabindranath Tagore writes, today the sky bends over the earth and softly whispers, I am yours. The earth says, how can that be? You are so great and I am small. The sky replies, don't you know? Around me, I have drawn the curtain of clouds to limit my space. The earth says, you are rich with the light of countless stars. I haven't a speck of light to call my own. The sky replies, today, I have lost my moon, my sun, my stars. You alone are left to me. My tear-filled heart trembles in the wind. You are ever unmoved, don't you see? Tears are welling up in my eyes, for my heart has grown soft like the heart of yours. And with the song of tears, the sky fills with the vast space that holds it to an eternal separation. And why do I read this amazing, beautiful, moving passage from Cloud Messenger is that sometimes tears help us hold earth and sky. And there is always this third, fourth way of being. Uh, in this case, the space is filled by the water. Um, and in this discussion, if you feel yourself going into either or thinking or saying, oh, Preeta, you said this, how can it be if that is true? And you want to raise your hand and say, Preeta, you said this, like I told my nine-year-old last week who learned the word hypocrite, <laughs> he said, we're holding paradox. 
So I'm teaching my nine-year-old and we all need to learn that. It's a huge decolonization work to hold paradox because it's all true. And we've seen that in everywhere, everything, all at once, <laughs> which has won many awards. So uh, that's the theme. And I just want to take you to take notes if you have your pen and paper, your phone, uh, really to make it real for you is what is the time you have to hold a paradox and that you felt you were able to? And what is the time when you could have been better supported to do that? And maybe you didn't feel as successful. And maybe one wish you have for an insight that will help you hold paradox. And so we can revisit at the end of this talk and we'll have question and answer time and you can ask me for that because this is your precious time and I am honored that you're spending it with me. Um, so I show this in all of my presentations and it's about holding paradox, but also about who I am. So um, I am, I feel I'm a mystic and I feel I've come to this work through embodied knowing. So I did not have a theological degree when I became Tuff's first Hindu advisor. And I needed to do that last year under the amazing mentorship of Dr. Lucy Ann Mosher. I am now a full Hindu chaplain. But before I had that theological understanding, I understood that we as human beings are in a spiritual experience. And that means that we're in sometimes a state which is practical and translated. We can say what we're enacting in this moment. And at other times we are dimensional. We are uninterpreted, esoteric. We are not necessarily earthed. We are very sky and abstract and air. And this is, we'll talk about the elements too. So if you can also take a moment and internalize this um, and um, identify your own spiritual practice, I will say that I, I was always an interfaith being. And I practiced with all my dear friends across all these dimensions of knowing. But yes, I am a Shakta. And that means that in particular, Ma Kalima is my, I always travel with Kalima and she always shows up for me. And I have some stories for you of how she does that. But here are some other dark mothers and they have been around and they still are in our collective. And I just want to name them. And then I want to take a moment for you to let them enter your dimensions of space and time. If any of them are calling to you, or if there's any I've missed, please call them out. So Oshun is a Yoruba, dark mother, the black Madonna, Christian dark mother. Sekhmet is an Egyptian dark mother. Yamaya is a Santeria dark mother. Iwa is a Haitian dark mother. Gaia, also known as Terra Mater, is a Roman Greek dark mother. Shekina is a Jewish dark mother. Pekate is a Greek dark mother. Pele is a Hawaiian dark mother. Panchamama is an Indian dark mother. And there's Kali, my personal Ishtadeva. Any that I forgot you want to call out? Yes. Oh, Medusa. Yes, Medusa. All the muses. All the elementals, the nymphs. Yeah. Um, so well, I'm going to first introduce you to Shaktism, which is my um, ground which I stand on, and Father Frank Cooney, who's at Harvard Divinity School, where I also teach meaning making, uh, would say that it is where you stand from that you look at other um, other um, contemplative practices for a comparative theology. Um, and so we'll practice in that space and then we'll move to other spaces, including womanism and eco-womanism, and apply it to grief, loss, and reimagination, themes that are very much of importance right now as we are all going through these types of transitions. So to begin, I wonder if you'll breathe with me three breaths of alone below, which is alternate nostril breathing. Why? Because it teaches us and of the holding paradox and of the divine masculine, divine feminine opening of Shushuma. So Ida, Pingala, Shushuma. So it's not just right, left, as we always talk about this false paradox. It's all of it. And so 
Uh, if you can find a comfortable seat, your feet firmly on the floor, maybe roll from your heels down to your toes, then aligning your hips with your shoulders, with your ears. You can soften your gaze or close your eyes. You'll um, use your thumb for your right nostril and you'll use your pinky for your left nostril. And we will start with an in-breath in the left nostril, closing our right nostril. So that's how we'll start in. We'll hold, we'll let out the right, hold, up the right, hold, out the left. And I will guide you, we'll do it three times together. So beginning with our left nostril, we take our first inhale together, hold, open the left, the right, close the left, out, hold it empty. Now in breath, switch, out breath, hold. Now the second breath together, in, hold, out, hold, in through the right, Hold, switch, out through the left. And our third, final deep breath in. Hold, switch, out. Hold, in. Switch, and out. Any words of how that practice was? One nose, one nostril is always a little bit off from the other. And so we do this for about five minutes until we feel shushima open up and feel balanced. Any words? Any thoughts? Very calming. Calming? Yeah. Thank you. Did you say it was strange? No? New? Was new to new? Thank you. So that's a practice of building paradox. Um, and I feel coming from the Hindu tradition, I am able to do that. I was able to do that as a business school professor. I was able to do that as a corporate exec. I remember I had two bosses named John and they would say, Preeta, how do you do all these multiple projects? And I would say, they would say, who do you pray to or God you pray to? And I say, well, Lord God Kali, we all have multiple arms, but also that we, have a holding in our Hindu traditions of uh, this way of being that all of us are drops of water that follow the tributaries to the vast ocean of being. And so any one of these drops of water, you, I, any one of us has our own, again, that practice that keeps flowing between a state and like me being Krita and the universal me being Brahma, right? There's the Jivatman, the lived embodied experience, and then there's this universal. So coming to Shakti, um, I, I really love the way you can move from Ekarup form, one Ishta Devata, one form, which for me is mostly Kali, and you can move to an Rupa form, like various ones. So like um, even one Ishta Devata can have this various forms. So, so Krishna can be like child Krishna, or can be lover Krishna to Radha, or can be like a father figure. So even Krishna has an Ekarupa forms, right? Um, let alone the, all the different forms between Kali, Durga, Lakshmi, Krishna, Shiv, um, Ganesh, uh, to uh, Arupa Bhakti or Advaita formless. And at some point, again, that's the holding that holding that paradox, like we can move through any and all of them, even in a day, let alone a lifetime. Um, and so I mentioned the um, Devi Mahakyam, which talks about from one form, Parvati comes Durga, comes Kali, comes seven different Shakti forms. In the Devi Mahakyam, which is found in the Marakandaya Pur Purana, 
it's five chapters. It's kind of equivalent to the Bhagavad Gita, which is found in Itihasa. It's found in the um, it's uh, uh, eighteen chapters um, around the same amount of verses, but they're they're coming out of these bigger tomes. And this one in particular talks about how Devi um, is the is the electricity of the dynamic form of who we uh, manifest and that shiv, that ever present meditating applied focused energy is the, again the application and I love to use the number 108 which is a sacred number for many reasons but my interpretation is one is shiv, zero is the pregnant nothingness of shakti and eight is that flow that I'm talking to you about that except eight is this way, but it's that infinite, <laughs> infinite flow. Um, I wanted you to see it in Sanskrit, the word Shakti. And any word in Sanskrit has many, many, many different translations. So when you read a translation of something into English from Sanskrit, please be aware of who has done the translation because it influences what words they get for the English meaning. Um, and I love the book, Sanskrit Non-Translatables, because there are some words that cannot be translated, even though we might try it. Um, so what I wanted to explain is for me, um, and why we'll get into eco-womanism, is the, the elements. And this goes to Sankhya philosophy and also Ayurveda, that the Hindu philosophy, we have almost like Taoism, we have from the Brahman is the two Purusha Prakriti, the male female aspect, and from the two come the five, which are the elements, earth, water, fire, air, ether. And, and almost you could say that's like our, our constitution, like each one of us has a dosha or, or we're either tridoshic or bidoshic or one do, you know, like, and so we're a frequency. And so that, that's really important because this is really important. So this slide, it just, <laughs> Shakti is hard to name and very easy to experience. And I, you know, Vinita and I talk about all these different experiences I've ever had, profound experiences of Shakti. And then people, when I give these talks and everyone's like, well, what is Shakti you never said? And I'm like, can I come back to this slide? <laughs> because I'm trying, I'm trying to help you understand, but it's like Shakti is hard to name and easy to experience. She is the ever expanding universe, the primordial force of creation. She is a mystic river that connects all the world's space, dynamic figuration that changes moment to moment. Attempting to capture her is like playing hide and seek. Leela. Playing hide and seek, not this new age Kali who's death, anger, and a symbol for women's rights. No, she's my mother. She's soft. She plays with me and she does some very trickster things like Ishu um, in, at the crossroads, which is the African god of the crossroads. So, yes, um, she's uh, this is a very important note. <laughs> so, how do we experience her then? You asked me, Frida, how do we experience her? If you're saying that Shakti is to be experienced, so this is a beautiful slide from uh, the Hindu American Foundation about ways, paths in our um, traditions. I practice all of them. I'm very happy in the question and answer to speak more to this, but very quickly, there are four purusharthas or goals of practice to have wealth, not just monetary. I know it shows that I think I knew I would be in this building. No, I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> uh, but wealth of all kinds of wealth of relationships of experience, um, karma or alignment are on our path, uh, karma or our desires. Yes, Hinduism is about our desires and embracing them and living fully. And moksha or um, I would say less liberation. I'm not one of those, but fulfillment of life, like flourishing life. And, and that way, I think I align a lot more with humanists. Um, and then there's these four different yogas, right? There's yan yoga, scriptural, like I told you the Devi Mahatyam, we can read that, we can understand it. 
uh, Raj Yoga or the Eight Limbs Path Ashtanga Yoga, you know, doing uh, practicing our yamas, niyamas, our asana practice, which I know in this country we say that's yoga. The one eighth of the one fourth of yoga is the yoga here. But um, asana practice or physical postures, pranayama or breath, which we just did one exercise alone, alone. Um, and meditation. Um, all of them have meditation. And then uh, uh, bhakti yoga, which is devotional puja, kirtan, dance. Um, and then um, karma yoga, which karma yoga, karma yoga, which is our service, our actions, that our actions are in service. And um, that last bit of my four practice was leaving everything and trying to become a Hindu chaplain. Um, and um, what has helped me is one major practice from the Taitra, Taitra Upanishad of the Panchakosha. So I will very quickly lead us through those five. Um, if you feel comfortable to go on the journey with me. Um, again, you can find your feet firmly on the ground, your hips, your shoulders and ears aligned, your gaze softened or your eyes closed. And we begin with your natural breath. So most of us find ourselves in this body. So just for the first few breaths, check in with your senses. What are you smelling right now? What are you tasting right now? What are you hearing? What are you feeling? And what are you seeing? Even though your eyes are closed, you might be seeing colors or images. This is Anamaya Kosha. This is the first Kosha. It's one of five. This is only one fifth or 20% of you. And we make it everything. And so in your next few breaths, saying thank you to your food eating sheep or Anamaya Kosha. If you can allow yourself to expand like the lotus, which is such a beautiful image in the Hindu faith and in other faiths, just allow yourself to open up as if a bud to sun, sunlight, and expand into your next level being, which is your energetic being, your prana maya kosha. Those of you who have read Malcolm Gladwell, the whole idea of blink is that someone can know you before you've entered a room. Well, that is your prana maya kosha. You've entered a room before your physical body has entered a room. So what is your energy like today? No judgment, just what are you bringing today? And saying thank you to that sheep. If you can allow yourself to unfold even further, your petal is a little bit further extended into your mental structures that hold you. And those mental structures, manamaya kosha, are things that society gives us, our parents give us, maybe they're part of our samskara or our way of being. It's just the scaffolding that holds your energetic and your food eating bodies. So in holding paradox, which is our theme for today, what might be a mental structure that is not serving you and that you could just put aside just for this lecture? And maybe you put that mental structure or scaffolding aside. Make sure you still feel secure in who you are, that your scaffolding still feels safe. And say thank you to your mental structure because it helps you to have form and move through and navigate this world. And we take one deep breath in and expand to our fourth intuition sheet. This is the ways of knowing that are not rational, that are not logical. These are ways of being that are intuitive. The Vigmya Maya Kosha, this is the antenna that help us be connected to spirit or whatever our words are to the universe, to the divine. Taking a few more deep breaths, are there any intuitions or insights coming to you at this moment?
and taking a deep breath in and saying thank you to the sheep, this layer of being, expand fully as the flower that you are into our Ananda Maya Kosha, our bliss body. What does that feel like? And it is okay if it doesn't come instantly. Maybe you can look back into your past, recent or past past, and remember a moment of pure delight. That's the word bliss, pure delight. Just maybe it was giggling, chortling, laughter, or just relaxation in the ultimate sense where you felt melded with all that was around you, you had no sense other than this feeling of lightness or being or unity, and we call it bliss, bliss body. And once you have that, maybe you put it in a metaphysical pocket so you can come back to it. And then slowly with breath, bring yourself back from the Ananda Maya Kosha to your Vigna Maya Kosha to your Mana Maya Kosha, back to your Prana Maya Kosha, to you sitting here right now in this body. And when you're ready, we can come back to each other. How is that for everyone? I love just some words, just shout out. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> stillness. Stillness. Holding paradox, stillness and expansion, right? This holding of a paradox. Right? Oh, thank you. Communal and individual. Thank you, those are beautiful. I wrote this poem um, on uh, September 2022. Um, there are many reasons I wrote this poem. I won't get into that for lack of time, but I wanted to read it to you and move into the part about elements, which will take us into ego wings. <laughs> And poetry is a uh, bhakti tradition, poetry, dance, architecture, math. Yes, math is a secret thing. <laughs> um, all of these are um, very sacred. And so poetry, sometimes you just have to dance. Have you ever seen the wind play with the fallen leaves in autumn? Have you ever heard the whistling through the lost teeth in a seven-year-old's mouth? Have you ever tasted the tang of too sweet fruit as it starts to become wine? Have you ever felt the fire too close to the skin, a few hairs burnt by the flames? Have you smelt the moist earth as your new hiking boots sink in the mud? All of these messengers sharing with us one essential truth. Sometimes you just have to dance with the eternal. And I wrote this because of paradox. Do you see all the paradoxes in there? Anyone notice one paradox you want to just shout out? Lost. There's a, little, there's a little bit of death in each of them. Yeah, lost teeth making beautiful sounds. Sunk shoes, new sunk shoes, mm. giving great smell. Fallen leaves, beautiful colors, right? So that's the paradox. And that's where I see Shakti. That's an experience. So there's no words to describe Shakti in this, but an experience. So um, I feel Dark Mother for me is the Pancha Bhutam, which we just spoke about the five elements. And this leads to womanism. So um, Alice Walker is a Pulitzer Prize winner of The Color Purple. Incredible life-changing book I read, but this is the sequel. And in the Temple of My Familiar, I was reading it after the color purple. I already felt like Alice Walker was onto something. She, in the color purple, talks about this spirituality in nature and just everything was just inspirational and moving. 
Um, in this second book, the daughter of the two main characters is describing her furiousness with academia. I really did understand. <laughs> <laughs> And she was talking about how it was excruciating to be in this academic setting. And she was telling the other person how she felt. And so she says, and, and when I read this, I would drop the book and I'm like, it's Ma, it's Kali Ma. But perhaps it's she who put the sword in your hand. Perhaps, said Fanny. Fanny is the daughter. Um, how did you know it was a sword? It really is a sword with a great golden handle and a shining blade, but it is in my look, not in my hand. I look at a blonde head and zip, it's in the gutter. Um, in, in this case, it was white patriarchy hurting her, so that's why the blonde head. But um, you can see where it could be any head, like Kali's, you know, chopping off of the ego or putting us in situations where we have to encounter our own healing or, um, you know, uh, that almost, I, I won't say purely trickster energy, but definitely Leela of um, what we need to do to move into um, our fullest lives, fullest beings. And so it really reminded me of um, the faith I was um, pursuing. And I wrote this in my postdoc about how Womanist theology isn't seen as spiritual. I've written papers that are going to be published where that was the number one critique is how can you see womanism as a as a spiritual practice? And I'm like, it is. It's not just an activism thing. It's a spiritual way of being. And then a lot of people said, oh, how can you see Shaktiism as an activist way of being? And I'm like, it is like actually it's been taken by new age to be a symbol for you know go out to vote and be in your power and so so the two were getting the two were overlapped but they were getting false dichotomies and so holding that together so i want to read a definition of womanist womanism womanist from In Search of Our Mother's Gardens uh, by Alice Walker. One, from womanish, responsible and charged serious. Two, also a woman who loves other women sexually and or non-sexually, loves music, loves dance, loves the moon, loves spirit, loves love, food and roundness, loves struggle, loves the folk, loves herself regardless. Womanist is too feminist as purple is too lavender. So I'm gonna end with eco-womanism. And if we have time, um, read some poems because the last part of my presentation is about poetry um, and moving into grief, loss, and reimagination. So, um, Eco Womanism, this beautiful book I carry with me, is a practice, a practice of practical practice of encountering earth honoring fates. Uh, many of them I named in one of the first slides where I had all the dark mothers. Um, like David Kingsley wrote, oh, I need to save these um, goddesses from being all about fertility, the earth, and uh, I forget what the third saving was, um, fecundity, fertility, earth, and oh no, I said uh, fertility, earth, and oh, motherhood, right? And, and I was like, no, you don't need to say them. Just redefine these things because mothers aren't just those who have physically had babies. And the earth is not just around sphere. It's all these elements and all the shapes and forms of all these elements running in our body and not. And fecundity isn't just about uh, fertile crops. It's about ideas and creation and co-creation. So we don't need to save the dark goddess, the dark, dark mother or goddesses from these three words, we actually need to redefine what earth, fecundity, and motherhood mean. So this is a practice. The first step that Melanie Harris tells us is honor our experience. So this goes back to the Shakti, like what are you experiencing? The second is mining eco-memory. I will talk about what eco-memory is. I want to read it directly from Melanie Harris. Eco-memory is Honoring experience and remembering the African-American historical roots in the environmental movement that highlights the significance of Black women's eco-spirituality, earth-honoring faiths, or earth spiritual activism, and treats these sources as valid epistemologies for environmental discourse. 
So, um, and, and whatever is that experience you've had. So whether or not it's been you read these books like I did and dropped them when you recognize something and you're like, no, this is calling me, or it's something you heard, or it, 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 it's about following those. And then step two is critical reflection on that experience. And what do we mean by critical? Not just like logical, rational, but that expansive um, five layered way of being um, critical in that sense. Um, an intersectional analysis, which allows you to see multiple perspectives, um, examining history and tradition, we're all located in a context that affects us. Step five is engaging transformation, and this is where we become more, we expand. My favorite word is and. Um, my children always remind me if I start to behave in a colonistic uh, way, and I'm like, do this, or they'll be like, mom, your favorite word's and. So uh, share in these dialogues and partner, like find someone in this room you can talk to and really share and like reach out and do this in individual and collective ways and take action. So I'm going to pause there, uh, Vineet, and start with questions. And if we have time, I'll I'll go to our um, poems because, and then I can even do my last shlok to close out energetically. Okay, so sure, I'll give it to you. Yeah, can we give you a, a yeah round of applause? <laughs> So we're going to open it up uh, to questions, comments, more of a free-flowing um, conversation, perhaps, if that's what's inspiring us. Um, but please don't be shy. So maybe just have a good-sized group here. So maybe just raise your hand. And... Yes. I want to ask you about the significance of dark when you're dark mother. Does it mean uh, unknown, unknowable, mysterious? Why did you use the word dark? So the question is, why the word dark? Does it mean unknowing, mysterious? Yeah, so Kali, Kal is time, but also people say Kal, like the dark, right? Um, but I think it's because my vision in that 108 kind of thing is that it's pregnant nothingness. It's the void. Actually, I did, maybe this is the reason, uh, Deepak Chopra describes it very well. He says, no matter how blank the void in the still it exists it's enough to um it's enough darkness to still us and we had this word stillness and expansiveness it's that pregnant nothingness like right it, like in death there is a potential for growth right and so that's that darkness right it's the nothingness it's the void we see it as dark we see it as black and we usually juxtapose it to light. And we usually hear about the uh, white father in the sky, right? Uh, Kristen McClellan has this beautiful book about um, the um, black god, goddess, right? And so um, so I think that's that's that holding paradox. It's not, it, it's not either or, it's this, the tears in between. Because, uh... The dark usually means something not desirable. Yeah. You know, versus the light. You know, when you say Tamas Om Jyoti Gumai, you say, lead me from darkness to light. This is something else, isn't it? No, I think it's the same thing. I think that's what I'm saying is it's both and. How can you have light if you don't know what the void is? If, if, if everything looked like that, what would light be? It would all be the same. So we need that, we need that play. We need that Leela. We need masculine, feminine to get Shushima. I was curious something else. I was curious when ego womanism was coined, like this how Walker had coined womanism. That's one of her, is there? Yes, yeah, so this book was written in 2021. So is that a fairly recent term? I don't know, but the book is recent. So I'm sure as being an academic, it takes you years to get the book. <laughs> so maybe those papers are being written and the talks are being given. Um, I don't have my book. I don't know when it will come out. <laughs> I'm just joking. But it probably it was before 2021. 
so it's a fairly recent. Yeah, yeah. Womanism was 1982. Yeah. Um, so thank you. This was really interesting. And I really like the concept of the paradox. I think it's really interesting that you had you had this, I guess, background or career in like business and like, being an executive and then now being in a more spiritual, I guess, space. I guess you can consider that a paradox, but it does coexist as well, right? Like you mentioned, being an individual and being a part of the community. I'm curious to hear a little bit about what made you shift into this space and study and I guess I don't want to say line of work but like uh what made you I guess move into this um so the question is what made me move into this oh my goodness I don't know um I think I was a little kid and I was very inclined towards spiritual pursuits but as an immigrant's daughter I wanted to contribute economic value. And I think I saw myself and many of us in the colonized world see ourselves as in a transactional market. Like I have to show up perfect and I have to be paid what I'm worth and I have to be valued. And if I make a mistake, then you can dock me pay and I'm a bad girl. And, you know, like, and there's no community, there's no messiness, there's no honoring each other. There's not long-term investment in each other. It's just like, today is another day. And I, I knew that it was like ever, always as a kid, I was just like kind of pushing up against that because there's many ways of being. I definitely can be transactional, um, but I wanted these other ways of being that go flow between that. And so um, I think, um, you know, I have an amazing, I had a mentee who's now like a very incredible leader out there and now a CEO, but when this person was starting out, I was at Deloitte and they asked me on their board and I was very frustrated. And I said, you know, um, Tomas, I don't, I don't think I should be on your board. I'm very frustrated. And it's like, no, 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 no. It's not for your Wharton or your Deloitte. It's for your spiritual direction. And I remember hearing these words and being like, okay, I need to sit down. <laughs> I'm like, I need to, I'm, I'm saying yes, I'll be on your board. And I did end up being on their board. And uh, but I had to look up spiritual direction, and it, it's it was it's not something we in the Hindu faith. I mean, Hindu chaplaincies knew, right? Hanith is one of the first. You guys are so lucky. You know I mean, like, um, uh, and and so it's new. This is all new. The womanism, all of this is like, um, yet it's so old, and that's the paradox. It's always been there, and we've had like I think in extended families in India, we had the spiritual director in the family. Right, we always had that person we could go to in our extended families that we would talk to about these life meaning making things. Um, and so, as the family shrunk and we, you know, we had to survive, we internally colonized ourselves. We lost this. And so, long answer to your question. <laughs> I think it found its way in me, and I started. And I've been very lucky. And not only that, Reverend Kirsten Boswell Ford at MIT. My dear colleague JY is there. Uh, we did our MIT internship together, and Reverend Kirsten Boswell Ford gave me a chance. Like, um, have you ever thought of chaplaincy? What's that? Um, why don't you do an internship with JY? <laughs> and you'll do exactly everything that this Harvard Divinity School um, Divinity uh, Master of Divinity student is doing. And 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 you will see what it is. And so, I mean, it's just it's been like that. And I think that's the way Ma, uh, Ma plays. I mean, we. Um, I was going to save this story for for Q and A. So I was sharing with Benita this weekend. I went to um, Connecticut to be with um, predominantly Christian group um, in spiritual retreat. And I knew that like I'm pretty much holding that Hindu energy. Um, and I always travel with Ma. I have a, a picture in my bag right now. I forgot because that morning I had to do holy in my child's classroom. And then I like ran here, ran there, and I forgot the image. And I came to the retreat. And I, so this was Friday night and I couldn't sleep. And I was, it, it, for multiple reasons. And then I wake up on Saturday and lo and behold, our guest speaker of all the things brings Kalima's picture and I walk into the room and I like start weeping because I'm like how does this happen 
Um, also, when I started my chaplaincy at Tufts, um, it was in 2020, we were virtual. I did not step onto the university campus as the first Hindu chaplain until 2021 into a new office. But guess who was waiting for me? Kalima, a big tapestry. Apparently, it came through my Catholic chaplain, my dear um, fellow Catholic chaplain, who in Harvard Square had come to meet someone who was visiting Boston and seen it and bought it, but then forgot it promptly and had another friend come through and pick it up. And then somehow it ended up in my office. So these are the things I'm saying. It's like, you have to experience. Yes. Spiritual direction, yes. Oh, yes, all of it, all of it. Thank you. Let me go back. Okay, so the spiritual, uh, the Gyan Yoga, Devi Mahatya, the Raj Yoga, um, my, the shlokas, I, I said one about um, this, this goddess, like I, I do see the sun is also, you know, sun, moon, earth, skies, right? So when I do my yoga, my asana yoga practice, you know, I and also my meditation, my image, my words, my my energy. Um, bhakti yoga, I do puja. Uh, uh, kirtan, I sing uh, mainly Bengali um, songs. Um, so we could do that later. I'll sing for you. Um, and then karma yoga, I'm here, right? Uh, with you, I feel like this is part of my service. First of all, I would love to hear you sing. Um, <laughs> please, please make that part of the poetry section at the end of the q &A. Sure. Um, so I have two questions. So my first is, in, in its spirit, um, I also feel like Shakti has come into my life in really special, beautiful, um, inarticulable ways. And much inarticulable. But I, I wonder, um, so, so much of my knowledge of Shakti and my devotion towards God, goddess, whatever, the force, whatever you want to call it, um, is personal and individual. So I wonder if you can speak a little bit about how one prays but for other people. I have requests, I have received a lot of requests recently. I, I have the desire as well to pray for other people. I'm unsure how to do that. I I I I'm I I struggle with what how to frame that prayer, what I'm actually asking for, how I can direct what my experience of Chucky is towards them. Or I, I I really I would love to hear your take on that. And then my second question is about um so much of new age religion is about you you go back to the scripture yourself and figure it out for yourself. And I, as powerful as that is, it is also so helpful to have a mentor or someone you call a guru or a guide. So for someone, it's wanting to explore more about like Shaka theology. Do you have any recommendations for how we can start that journey with a guide? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So I will go back to my first slide and answer that. So please do read Dr. Anila Bhattacharya Saxena's books. Okay. And also Dr. Raj Balkaran. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, there's so many more, but that's where to start. Like this. Um, and then I'll answer your first question with another slide. So whatever that is, your tipping point to go into the dimensional un, uh, uninterpreted esoteric. So like when people, when I'm, I'm uh, now co-chair of the Mystic Soul Project, mysticism, all the mystics, if you read them, they're so similar. They're like at the top of Mystic Mountain and they're way closer to each other than their base camps, <laughs> right? Like they have climbed Mystic Mountain. They are here, all of them are talking the same thing. And their base camps are, yeah, far apart at the base of the mountain on different sides with different language. But when, you, when you're when you having this experience, you're crossing over, right? 
and we do it. We can't, and there are moments when uh, mystics have written things that are more state translated practical, and it's a little harder for us to understand. But then you go back to their mystic mountain, top of the mystic mountain stuff, and everybody gets it. It's about love. Mm -hmm. Right, and you love these people, whatever those words are. If you want to use elements for me, like I feel like we're all elemental beings, and so that's what I use. But whatever that word is for you that helps you get between the states. I'm sorry, that was that an answer to how to pray for other people? Yeah, okay. So, how I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having difficulty understanding. So, how would you frame that? Like, so I'm moving between the infant, the you know, the symbolism. Yeah, so you're finding it hard to move from your practical, like your view, to praying for somebody else. Oh, I see. Okay. Is that helpful? Yes. Okay. We can talk about more. Okay. <laughs> yes. Hi. Uh, I have a two part question. Sure. First one is uh, Carl Jung. Yes, yes, uh, no, very well. He had talked about such synchronicity. Yes. Later writings, uh, almost close to the end of his life. Uh, first part of the question is, do, do you do you see it as the same thing, what you're talking about? Do you just... I did, I gave you so many synchronicities. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the second thing is, uh, what you're talking about is, you know, the connection with creativity. For example, uh, you're trying to write an article and you don't know how to express something, and then you sit in meditation and then it just comes. You know, the, the, some idea comes which you, you could never think in your waking moments, and then you get this sort of a, almost like a flash that this is the way you should do it, or uh, something else. You're looking for a solution to some problem, you know, and it just flashes to you in your meditative state. So, do you see that happening in your the the event that you're talking about? You know, Deepak Chopra used the word pure potentiality. Yeah, yeah, okay. yes. uh, Wayne, the doctor Wayne Dyer used to say manifestation. You know, if you want to manifest something, deep desire, then you have to go into a state of silence, uh, true silence. Uh, have you observed that? You know, the creativity part coming up. Yeah, the, the, but we, we need to follow the deep silence with action and words. We have to do that constantly because people can't read our minds yet. Right? So we, we, we have to go in. What is it really I want to communicate? What is mine to say? How should I say it? It'll come. And then I need to go do it. And then I have to, again, come back. Think about it was, you know, is it real for me still? We're dynamic, you know, prakriti and prakriti, right? We're constantly, uh, there's our nature and then there's like what's happening. And especially now with whatever, I mean, this is a very dynamic time. Things are changing all the time. So it's very important to do both. And, and more, again, not just false dichotomies. <laughs> it's like many ways of being, but I like there's definitely two steps and there could be three or four or five ways of being. I need red time. We we are. Um, but again, thank you so much. Do you want to do you want to close out with a poem or it's it's up to you? But uh, the song? Okay, I'll 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 close with this song. Mayer paye jaba hoye ot na pote mon. Amar mayer paye jaba hoye ot na pote mon. Jani joy maloti hai, kato gondha je chorai, tabu gore thele pore kache ni je re bilai, pore tor moto je ne kota der mai koi ala pon tor moto je, o mon tor moto je ne kota der mai koi ala pon, mai er paye jaba hoye ot na pote mon, amar mai er paye jaba hoye ot na pote mon. Amar tai to lage bhoi, polo bone phade pore hoi bhoji bha koi. Ore jana bhulish na, tur daya mo ima, ta rakta ma ka kalo rupe gochai kali ma. Ore tai boli ai, oi ranga pai kore, ar tur sharmo pon tai boli ai. 
Can I be like the flower who the red hibiscus who is put at the foot of Kali's feet? May my mind expand. May I not be like those flowers that smell fragrant and are taken from all the puja sites because of that, because that's what I'm afraid of, that I'll be alone in a drift. May I be like the hibiscus always at her feet. Thank you so much. One more time for Mr. Banerjee. Thank you.